uh, of clarifying uh, value for both me and all of us. Uh, so in other words, I'm just saying that I don't have a complete uh, formulated argument or thesis that I'm going to make, but I'm going to kind of lay out a whole bunch of uh, issues out um, and then try and find a way to think about uh, think about it all together. Uh, uh, a task that I have been somewhat unsuccessful at, and so I'm hoping that all of us together will be a little more successful at it. So, <clears throat> about a little uh, less than a year ago, I was in the town of Kyonja in Orissa. Um, it's not it's northern Orissa, almost to the border of Chartan, and. Uh, uh, I was there for a few days with a uh, with a colleague from the Mining Zone People's Solidarity Group, uh, Shalini Gera. Shalini and I were there gathering some data for the report that we were at that point writing on the POSCO project. Uh, the report that came out this last October, in October 2010, uh, we published a report called Iron and Steel, the POSCO India Story, which uh, was an effort to uh, challenge some of the figures that the company POSCO and uh, 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 the government of Orissa and the government of India had been using to justify the project. And uh, we had found in our initial investigation starting January 2010, we had found a lot of inconsistencies with that data uh, that they were quoting. And so we decided that uh, uh, one of the things that we found was that there was absolutely no data about the economy on the ground in the either the steel plant port area or the mining area. And so we decided that given that the entire project is moving forward in a condition wherein there is absolutely no details about what exists on the ground except as anecdotes, we decided that our task, our first task, was to at least put together some basic data. And so we embarked on that process and that took us to Kionjur, uh, which is uh, part of the Kandadar Hills. Uh, and that's where the mines for POSCO are supposed to be located. I'll come back and talk about POSCO in a little bit, and I'm not going to assume that everybody has an introduction to that controversy in India. I'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. But um, um, where, while we were there, uh, and we were you know, meeting with various folks, trying to piece together some data about you know, everybody, everything including uh, um, uh, minor forest produce that is collected by the local Adivasi, the local uh, uh, tribals, uh, trying to put together uh, data about the uh, size of each village that might be affected by the POSCO mines, etc., etc. Uh, one of the people that we were working with there, a person by the name Dushkar Barik, uh, Dushkar kept telling us that, you know, you know, kept warning us about when we were ready to leave from Kyonjo, he needs to know in advance and he needs to book our bus tickets, and he needs to book our bus tickets in a particular fashion. So we initially didn't pay too much attention, but as the second day wore on, we kind of said, what is it all about? And he said, you have to leave town before 9.30 in the night. He said, because after 9.30 in the night, this place becomes a complete mess because of the, lorry, because the trucks and lorries coming in to move the ore. Uh, the whole area is a mining area, and uh, um, uh, and so um, he said that, and we said, okay, go ahead and do that. We are planning to leave today. And one, one of the things that he did just around then, should also tell you a little bit, uh, which is that just after we finished this conversation about the bus ticket, uh, he, we hadn't gone to a single mine itself at that point, because we had said, you know, we certainly didn't want to do that thing about going and trying to meet a community that was affected already. And it's a, such a short thing. We, did, we, we thought it would turn into a little bit of a touristy exercise if we did that. So we're kind of staying away from that and just doing purely, just sit in office rooms, various places, and collect data if possible. And so he said, if you really want to understand what's happening to people here, I'll just do a small experiment with you. And he drove us on a you know, somewhat of a, um, a kacha road and brought us, not a kacha road, a pakka road that had been destroyed by, I presume, the number of trucks that were plying on it brought us to a halt at one point and uh, pointed to a Kirana shop around maybe 20 meters down the road and said we are about uh, we are about at least seven to eight kilometers from the closest mine. Uh, why don't you just walk up to there and buy a bottle of refrigerated water? He said, ask for water, ask for you know, fridge serena. And I couldn't understand why, why he was doing that. I got out, walked up to there, got it and came back. By the time I walked back to the car, uh, the bottle had turned red. Uh, 
because of the ore dust in the air. And uh, it was not visible to us, but the bottle had turned red by literally in the 50 meters or 30 meters that I walked back and got into the car. And it was an interesting two days because through the two days, we didn't see any of the activities related to mining apart from, you know, because we were sitting in offices collecting data. And then in that night when we left, we couldn't get the 930 bus. We got uh, only the 1030 bus. And so Dushkar said all the best and put us on the bus. And uh, Katak is just 170 odd kilometers from there. We should have made it there. We should have made it to Katak in around three and a half, four hours at the outside. We left at 1030. We made it to Katak next morning at 1030. The first 40 kilometers took us around eight hours. And for eight hours, uh, for, for the first 40 kilometers, for the eight hours, till it was dawn, literally, there was an uninterrupted line of trucks lined up on the other side, right? So for, you know, nearly 40 kilometers, you have this uninterrupted line of trucks that is stretching out from town through the hills, you know, getting into town, collect the ore and then leave, right? And in front of us and behind us is, of course, all the, also trucks, the same, same length of trucks, right? So that's what, and, and this is moving, inching sh slowly. Drivers would switch their engines off and go to sleep. And so every time anything moved, you have to go wake up all the drivers in front, come back. You know, that whole drama was going on. I start with the story just to kind of uh, think through the question of, a particular kind of acceleration in extractive uh, industries and e extraction generally in India and trying to understand the politics around that. And um, what I want to do is to uh, kind of open up the kind of a, a, a bit of thinking to ask the question, what are the ways in which over the last 30 years or over the last 20 years the uh, the, the terrain, the territorial uh, space called India has been restructured. In what ways has it been reorganized, restructured so as to uh, create the economy that we have now and create the kind of social, the social conditions that we have now. Um, one strand of the story is to look, of course, at the special economic zones. And uh, I, I won't go into the numbers of special economic zones, etc., because I myself don't, uh, don't necessarily keep track of the exact numbers, etc. They are coming and going. But um, uh, in 2005, there was a Special Economic Zones Act that was passed. And uh, it kind of opened up the space for the creation of what, in the simplest terms, can be said, uh, well, can be described as the creation of zones where almost none of the laws of the, of, of the state operate, right? It's carved out spaces for industry and uh, these spaces, I mean, in the final stages of a really short two-day debate about the Special Economic Zones Act in Parliament, the, the CPM uh, suddenly got up and waved its hands and said, we want some labor laws implemented. And so there are a couple of clauses in there which kind of give some kind of uh, lip service to labor law, but they are more or less ineffective in as much as the, the, the zones are entirely out of the jurisdiction of any state power in, in, uh, in that area. For instance, for a collector of that region to get into a special economic zone, he needs special permissions. He can't just go into that space, right? So in, 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 in that sense, it's, it's a particular kind of uh, creation of a particular kind of space that happened through that act. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is, having said that, I want to do two things. One is to kind of think about the creation of those kinds of spaces and what kind of histories exist around that, and simultaneously think about what kind of activities the production of that kind of space is producing in the contemporary context. To go to the history, I mean, one interesting line of thinking that one could do is to go back to other things with similar sounding names, like we had export processing zones, right, and, and things like that, right. And so, um, if you go back to that history, that's a particular moment in the 70s when that's inaugurated, 
The first one is in Kandla in Gujarat, and from there, there are just six other export processing zones that are created across the country. And these are really tiny compared to the current special economic zone structures. These are really tiny. That is, uh, the minimum uh, number of hectares uh, that a special economic zone, uh, IT special economic zone, uh, can have is around for 300 times more than what the largest uh, export processing zone was uh, back in the 70s. Right? And uh, one way of reading the export processing zone story in the, in the mid-70s, late 70s, and the 80s is to think about it in terms of a particular regime of thinking uh, about economics, about the nature of the economy, and saying that uh, as the country was uh, um, getting further and further integrated into the global capitalist economy, it was running into all sorts of problems around balanced payments, etc. And the export processing zones and other such zones created during that time frame were essentially, one could argue, certain kinds of defensive structures so as to create spaces wherein the quote unquote there was an attempt that the state was making to deal with some of those problems in, in terms of its integration to the global economy, but simultaneously claimedly protect the rest of the country from the ill effects of those productions. Right? So it was a way to carve off a space and say all sorts of shit can happen in here, but let's not take that out of here. Right? Let's, we have a whole bunch of problems being uh, developing because of the integration of the global economy. Let's do a whole bunch of things here. And that was a kind of a popular solution that a lot of different countries in the third world adopted at that point. Right? That it didn't amount to it, that it had all sorts of other effects, that none of them delivered what they promised. All of that's a different story, but I just want to kind of lay out the initial logic of it and say that that logic is, in a certain sense, what leads over a period of time to the creation of the special economic zones of the logic. Right? Wherein you then go through a process, the state and various quasi-state bodies and NGOs go through a process of using some of these export processing zones and all sorts of data from these zones to make a case of how successful those were, right? To create a particular discourse of success around that, and that discourse is what then finally leads to the opening up of the country for this idea of special economic zones, right? So, if we talk in the language of creation of spaces, enclosures of various kinds, as a particular enclosure, it's kind of part of the broader neoliberal strategy wherein you have a particular justification which makes sense even within a nationalist logic and how then that gets, in, that gets interrupted and subjected to a particular neoliberal logic and formulated and, and a whole new kind of space is created out of that. Right? So that's kind of one quick way of looking at that history. But what did the special economic zone itself begin to mean once the 2005 Act went through? What kind of spaces was it creating? Right? Uh, I would make an argument that there were at least two kinds of spaces it was creating. Right? And maybe more, but at, le at the minimum two kinds of spaces. And I'll kind of um, uh, 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 go into the details of these two kinds of spaces through two examples, the second one being POSCO. The first story I want to talk about is the story of the Alibag SEZ in Maharashtra, uh, which uh, is not so much an SEZ, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's actually more popularly referred, referred to as the Ranjankar SEZ, because Ranjankar is kind of the core, the central village uh, around which the SEZ widens out, and some parts of Alibag town or the